Thank you so much for joining us for LS Online. We're grateful that you're taking the time to stay caught up with the sermon series currently being taught at Living Stones Church in Elko, Nevada. Although we're honored to be able to provide this online content, we wanna make clear that this is not to replace your personal involvement in a local church in any way. So please use this service when you need to, but make it a priority to get plugged into a local gospel preaching church where you can worship, serve, and give as soon as possible. God bless you. Now please enjoy. Well, good morning, Living Stones. Hey, it's so good to see you guys out here on this brisk fall morning. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you guys are still out in the foyer, come on in and find a seat. We're going to get started. Our call to worship today comes from Isaiah 41.10. It says, Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Church, in every situation, we find hope knowing that nothing is out of God's control. Everything happens according to God's plan, and he will protect his people. Our God is sovereign, our God is just, and our God is faithful to deliver us. Church, would you please stand and let's worship together. From the darkness, I called your name into darkness, your mercy came. You called me out, lifted me up, how great is your love. You bore my weakness, you took my shame, buried my burdens in fields of grace. You called me out, lifted me up, how great is Step down to earth with the sin perfection. Give your life for us, and we are amazed. Yes, we stand in awe, for we have been changed by the power of the cross. How great, how great, how great is your love. How great.
Amen, church. Amen. There is a king seated among us. Let every heart receive him now. Where there is praise, he will inhabit. There will be grace and mercy all around. And every Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you that you are faithful. We thank you that you are just.
God, and we thank you that we can trust you to provide for us and to protect us, God. Father, be with us as we hear your word today. To you be the glory and the honor and power forever. And all his children said, amen. Amen. Good morning, church. My name's Mickey, and I'm a member here at Living Stones. I'm so excited to be here worshiping with you all today. Thank you for making time with the family of God and worship of God a priority this morning. To the family at Living Stones, what's up? Hey, guys, good to see you. Um, if you are new or visiting, first of all, welcome. Thank you so much for stepping outside of your comfort zone to be here with us today. I just want to take a brief moment to talk about the number on the side screens over here. This is our text in church number, um, and this is how we communicate to you everything that we've got going on at our church. So you'll get updates on everything we've got going on, reminders, important stuff, all of that jazz. And if you text welcome to this number, we also get to hear how you heard about LS. Elko, and that helps us to know what avenues best bring people into this building. Our mission is to get the message of Christ out and into our city, and your feedback would be a huge help with that. So if you are new or visiting, please take a moment to text welcome to the number on the side screens. Alrighty, guys, we have turned our attention to the Lord through musical worship. We have been welcomed into the house of the Lord this morning, and now it's time for us to welcome one another. As we turn to our neighbors in greeting, be reminded that God through Christ has welcomed us. Turn to your neighbor and say hello. <laughs> Alrighty, guys, as you make your way back to your seat, you can go ahead and take a seat. Um, we we're going to start with a few important dates for you guys. So if you are a calendar keeper type of person, go ahead and write these down. All right, first up, we want to talk about our LS roots for just a second. These are on our important dates every week. Our high school group meets on Tuesday nights from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m., and our middle school group meets on Sunday afternoons from 3 to 5 p.m. right here at church. Um, really quick from the LS Roots, all of us leaders and students wanted to say thank you so much for your participation in the candy drive. Everyone who walked through Trick or Treat Street this year received a huge handful of candy and an invitation to our Christmas service. So thank you so much for helping our LS Roots to be in the city for the city. To stay up to date with everything that's going on with our youth group, make sure to follow us on um, Instagram and Facebook. That's just LS Roots. Or you can text Roots to that same church number that we talked about earlier. Um, also up for our important dates, we've got baptism class. That's going to be on November 17th. So if you are interested in getting baptized or if you have questions about what baptism is, that class would be for you, and that's going to be on November 17th. And lastly, uh, starting point is simply where you start at Living Stones. So if you have questions about our church, are interested in pursuing membership, or you just want a little bit more information about everything we've got going on here, starting point is for you, and that will be on December 1st. Next up, you guys, we have our next levels. These are ways that you can take your relationship with God or with our church to the next level. <laughs> First up, we wanted to take a moment and remind you guys that our annual year-end gift is coming up. Each year, we receive a special offering around Christmas time to give back and help meet the needs of those um, not only here in Northern Nevada, but all around the world. We are once again partnering with Living Water. Their mission is to demonstrate the love of God by helping communities acquire desperately needed clean water and to experience living water, the gospel of Jesus Christ, which alone satisfies the deepest thirsts. You will have an opportunity to take place in this special offering beginning on December 1st, so please prayerfully consider what you might contribute over the next couple of weeks. 
Next up, we'd like to remind you guys once again and encourage you to sign up for this year's first annual Living Stones Churches Conference. It's happening in Reno on November 11th through the 13th, and our goal is to see as many of us from Elko roll up to Reno and grow in our faith and excitement in Jesus Christ through this conference. The speaker lineup is incredible, and there's also going to be a couple different workshop options where you can pick a particular area of faith that interests you and grow in that. I know that this conference is going to be a blessing to anybody who attends, so make sure you get signed up soon. That's on November 11th through the 13th. And lastly today for our next levels, we have another installment of our Helping Everyone Find Everything in Jesus testimony video series. And today we're gonna watch a short clip from Kyle and Adeline Craig's testimony video. It was a pleasure to sit down with them and hear how Jesus has changed their life. They had so many encouraging words that we can't show the full 15 minute video in church today, um, but we can be looking forward to seeing another short clip from this video in a couple weeks and having the full video released on YouTube and social media very soon. So without further ado, please enjoy. Hi, I'm Kyle Craig. Hi, I'm Adeline Craig. And this is our testimony. In that brokenness, you know, you get to see, you know, the worst in people. You see a lot of trauma, you see a lot of uh, death and heartache and, and all. And ultimately, you know, that led into my life a little bit of fears into law enforcement, I ended up getting a, a divorce. And that was really hard for me because, um, you know, you, you have this story of what you think your life's gonna be. And um, when I, you know, preach for the youth group for a while, you know, you tell them you can lose your house, you can lose your, your spouse, you can lose um, your belongings. And at the end of the day, you're still gonna have Jesus. And when it came to that point where you know, rubber meets the road. I don't have my home. I don't have my life. All I have is um, my church, and I have my God. And I think in those hardships, where God really wants to press you is into faithfulness and staying steadfast in that faithfulness, showing up, um, worshiping even when things are hard, um, seeing what good he has already given you and trusting that he's going to get you through um, what you're going through in that moment. And in the little things of faithfulness that you stick with, your daily disciplines, you, no, no matter how hard it gets, you keep praying, you keep showing up to church, you, you serve, you tithe. It's not something that you do expecting God to give you something. It's because you love him. And in that you find so much joy and you find um, more than you could have ever asked for. And, you know, God did just that, delivering me out of that um, brokenness and letting myself um, just bask in the light of Christ. Um, it goes back to asking that question, who do you think you are? Um, I am a son of God. I am loved and saved before the foundation world and he calls me his son and a lot of good came from that um I was able to meet my wife and my wife Adeline and we developed a really great friendship we um have a couple dogs so we went to the dog park and just hung out and um, just developed a really beautiful friendship out of that because I think that's where all great relationships start with is, can you be a friend with this person? She's gonna be my best friend. She's quirky and, and funny and a little weird sometimes, but um, she just brings, <laughs> she brings so much joy to my life and um, she's got such a level head and um, a, a huge heart for God. She loves the people of this church. She loves Jesus because she loves kids and she just wants to um, love well, serve well, and see people come to Christ. You know, I, I just think about a story of Job where he lost everything, but he was still faithful. And um, through that faithfulness, he was um, blessed bountifully. And while I'm no Job by any means, um, I'm thankful for what God has given me, and I'm thankful for the trials and sorrows and and um, 
nights of crying out to him, why is this happening? Because I see the fruitfulness of what he's brought to me. All right. Um, so like I said, um, in a couple of weeks, we're going to get to hear a little bit more from Adeline's side of the story, and then the full video will be released on social media soon. Thank you guys so much for sharing your testimonies with us. All right, guys, without further ado, it is time to read God's word. Today, we are going to be in Revelation 8, 1 through 6, and that is on page 969 in the Black Bibles around the room. Go ahead and turn there, and whenever you're ready, go ahead and stand for the reading of God's word. If you don't have a Bible of your own, please grab one of these black Bibles around the room, write your name in it, and take it home. The people of Living Stones give generously to ensure that everyone has access to God's word. All right, we are going to be in Revelation 8, 1 through 6, and it says, When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. This is the word of the Lord. Please pray, Please pray with me. <laughs> Dear Lord, thank you so much um, for yet another opportunity to gather as the family of God, to praise and worship you, to learn more about you and to grow closer to you, Lord. Um, I lift up Pastor Nathan as he's about to come out and preach this um, complex and somewhat confusing text, Lord. I just pray that... Um, he would be able to speak clearly um, and speak nothing but the truth of your word today, Lord. Um, I pray that you would open our hearts all across this room to what you would have for us today. I pray that you would convict us where we need convicting and encourage us where we need encouragement, Lord. Um, and I just pray that we could hear what it is that you have for us, Lord. We will hand this time over to you um, and just ask that your presence would be in this room with us. Um, and we pray all this in your name. Thank you. Amen. All right. You guys can be seated. not lose heart. Even though this present age will waste away, we will surely suffer, but it's a slight momentary trouble. The deconstruction is painful, but the transformation is beautiful. When we, the children of God, are crushed under the heavy affliction of this world, be reminded that it's weightless in comparison to the eternal measure of God's glory. We have lost our eyes for the unseen and have swallowed the false hope of the visible. We must realize the empty grave and revel in the certainty of his resurrection with assurance of renewal, considering it worthy to suffer for the faith. So we will worship while we wait. Morning, Living Stones. Morning. It's good to be with you guys this morning. Um, I spared uh, Mickey from having to read all of chapters 8 and 9. Uh, which we're actually looking at today. If you were a uh, part of the, the text and church group, which I hope you are, if you're not, you should be, you should text welcome to that number. I let you guys know we're going to be doing chapters eight and nine. So to read those ahead of time, uh, because even though we got to sleep an extra hour, apparently I don't get an extra hour to preach. Uh, it doesn't work that way. Um, so uh, anyway, um, hope you guys are ready. Are you ready? Let's get into the word then. Seriously, guys, thank you so much for being here this morning. We're continuing uh, in our sermon series in the book of Revelation called Between Two Worlds. Quick review. So far, we've seen the scroll opened, the seals broken. We've talked about the four horsemen of the apocalypse, that these judgments of God that were uh, released into the world. And, and as we looked at these things, we were, of course, talking about the reality of the suffering and brokenness that's a real thing in this world that we live in, a world broken by sin and filled with evil. Uh, we talked about how the kingdom of darkness revolting against the coming of the Lord Jesus into the world brings terrible things. Uh, what we talked about, family, is this truth. The war for souls is on. There's a full board war for souls going on in the world. We can look around us, turn on the news. We can see the effects of, of these horsemen and things in the world around us, but we don't even have to look that far. All we have to do to see pain and suffering and difficulty in life is look into our own hearts, don't we? We saw last week, though, the good news that God has sealed his people in the world. 
that come what may, life or even death, his church will stand and endure and nothing will be able to blot his people from the earth. Amen. We talked about how we will stand while we live and even when we die, we will stand because of the salvation bought for us by the blood of the lamb, the Lord Jesus. He alone is our hope and our salvation. We saw last week the beautiful picture that the end for those of us in Christ is that we will stand around the throne of God alongside people from all nations and tribes and tongues, and we will worship and declare the praise and worthiness of God Almighty. Family, there is salvation and hope for all who through faith are sealed by the spirit of the living God. That is good news for us, church. And it's really good news, especially since what we're going to talk about today is the judgment of God against the wicked in the world. Family, what we see in this vision that John is is given, what we see next in these two chapters is seven trumpets are blown, each unleashing a judgment of God into the world. Now, uh, Pastor Eugene Peterson said that in the blowing of these seven trumpets, like with most of Revelation, he said, we don't learn or see anything new, but what we actually see are old things in a new way. Okay? The truth of the reality for the world, family, The truth that has already been discussed previously in the scriptures is now being revealed again in a new way through these, this imagery, this truly disturbing and powerful imagery that John sees here. Okay. Now I want to be very, very clear with you guys. I have 35 minutes to cover two chapters of judgment. So follow me on this. What we see happening here is the judgment of God being brought into a wicked and unbelieving world so that, listen, the wicked in the world might repent of their sin and turn to God. That's what we're seeing in the text here. Now, you guys read it, I hope. You're looking at it right now in your Bibles. This is intense. The stuff we're talking about is intense. It's a very difficult thing to preach on, even just to talk about. And that's actually why a lot of churches in today's day and age simply avoid it. They just won't talk about it. They avoid the book of Revelation. Somebody told me after the 8 a.m. that their pastor told them several years ago not even to bother reading it. Family, here's why it's so difficult. It's because we want God as love, amen? God is love, but we often don't want to or struggle to acknowledge that not only is he love, but he's also holy. He's also just, and his holiness and justice must answer sin and wickedness in the world. Because family, if it doesn't, then he's actually not loving. God is love and God is just. We need both. But it's difficult to talk about. I mean, even even the cry of our culture in the world today is is not justice, right? It's it's acceptance and tolerance. Like, Like, if you were to speak the truth in love to another person in their sin, you're going to be accused of being demeaning and judgmental, aren't you? No matter what. And so what do we do? We just shy away from it entirely. I just, I just, I don't want the conflict. I don't want to deal with it, right? Yet, this text, 8 and 9, and 10 and 11, show us graphically that there is judgment from God against sin and wickedness. There is judgment from God against those who oppose him and his kingdom. Like, it's, it's a powerful thing to see. In fact, it's, it's so powerful that as Mickey did read in chapter 8, verse 1, before these trumpets are blown, the seventh seal on the scroll is broken, and it says that all of heaven goes completely silent for half an hour. Like, can you imagine that? All of heaven goes silent for half an hour. I want you to think about what's happening at the realization of the judgments of God about to be poured out into the world. All of heaven goes quiet. It's, it's like that moment when you're watching somebody like perform an incredible act. I like to think of like a trapeze artist, right? 
and they swing down and they go up into the air and they let go of that bar. And everybody watching is like, <gasps> and there's this moment where you're on the edge of your seat and you're holding your breath because you know, if they don't grab that other bar, it doesn't go good, right? There's this anticipation of something big that's going to happen. That's what's happening in this moment in heaven. Heaven goes silent. Something big is about to happen. Now, with these things, as I mentioned, and with everything else in the book of Revelation, we're not learning or seeing anything new. Okay? Jesus himself already talked about the judgment he would bring into the world in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verse 49, for example, when Jesus said, speaking of his coming, that he came in part to cast fire upon the earth. That's another way of saying Jesus came to bring judgment into the world, judgment against the wicked and evil in the earth. It's just a factual part of why Christ came into the earth. But it wasn't only for that. Later, in the gospel of Luke chapter 19 verse 10 Jesus also says that the son of man speaking of himself came to seek and to save that which is lost Jesus said both things he came for judgment and salvation what we have to live in here is the tension between the truth that both judgment in the world and Christ seeking to save the lost go together. They go together. Listen, as I said, they have to go together, church, because if there isn't justice for wickedness and evil, then there isn't true love. There must be both. We need God to be both just and merciful, righteous and gracious. Even though we don't like to talk about it or engage with the judgment of God, here it is in front of us. Just because we don't like it doesn't mean it isn't real or true. Okay? I actually heard a pastor say one time, he said, judgment actually tells us that God cares. Judgment says to us that our choices matter to God. Judgment tells us that God takes evil and sin seriously. Judgment says that God is not indifferent to or tolerant of evil or sin. Judgment assures us that God will move against evil and sin. Have you ever experienced the evil and sin of the world and wondered when justice was going to happen? Have you ever looked around and go, were they just going to get away with that? When is justice going to come? Oh, it's going to come. It may not be justice at your hands, but it will be justice in God's. Okay. Just judgment of God shows us that God is actually loving. Now, look, having said that, it's really important, church, that we engage with the part of the vision that we see next here for what it really is. And I want to tell you what we're witnessing. What we're witnessing in these chapters is the answer of God to the cries and the prayers of the martyrs who were suffering because of the persecution in the world and the four horsemen and the things we talked about in chapter 6. As they cried out to God for justice in chapter 6, verse 10, this is God answering them. And I want to show you. Let's go back. Turn back a page to chapter 6, verse 10. I want to read it with you so you can see this. It says they, speaking of the martyrs, the believers who were suffering in the world, it says they cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? They're saying, God, how long is wicked and evil going to get away with these things? It feels like forever. What they're told in verse 11 is that more, more believers in Christ will suffer. More will even lose their lives. But God says, listen, I will not wait forever to respond. He says, I won't wait forever. In fact, chapter seven last week showed us that even, even the the martyrs who suffered and died because of their faith in God, even them, Revelation seven says, we saw some of them standing around the throne of God worshiping. The elder told John, John said, who are these people? And the elder said, they are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. And he said, their robes have been washed white in the blood of the lamb. And so family, what we're seeing in chapters eight and nine and 10 and 11 is that God was not and has not been refraining from justice and judgment against the wicked. 
but that God's righteous judgment on the wicked in the world is being worked out, as one scholar said, even right now on the stage of history itself. God has already answered and is answering. Why? Because he's just. Because he's just. Now, guys, I know, 35 minutes for two chapters on judgment. I get it. It's a lot. We're drinking from the fire hose. But I want you to see that these judgments that are being poured out onto the earth, they are judgments of God, yes. But they're also, at the same time, the mercy of God. I know there's tension there. Follow me. John tells us this. As you read these things in chapter eight and nine, you'll notice that these these judgments are poured out. Did you notice that they only have, John says, a one third effect on the world? Do you see that? It's like an interesting fraction, right? Like, why are there fractions in the Bible? I thought we were done with fractions, right? Look, as with every other number in Revelation, this is not to be taken literally. It is a symbol. It is talking to us about a different reality. And I want to tell you what it is, okay? John is communicating that the judgments are not being allowed to have a full three-thirds effect in the world, but they're being held back. Why? Because the point of these judgments themselves is actually mercy. Listen, these trumpets, these partial judgments, they are serving as a warning to the wicked in the world that they're running out of time to turn to God. That's that's what we're reading. These partial judgments are showing the wicked in the world that they do not get the last word. They are not all powerful. Time is running out. Evil and wickedness will be eradicated. These judgments are are screaming to the wicked in the world that regardless of what they do, the kingdom of God will come fully to this earth and there will be no place for the wicked but hell. This is the message of these judgments. I want to read to you what another uh, scholar I was reading said about it. I'll put it on the screen for you. He said, What's being revealed to us is that God warns the world through acts of judgment worked out on the stage of history. The harsh realities of history sound the alarm to the wicked, right? That something is wrong and they better get it right. The harsh realities of history sound the alarm to the wicked. Remember, says you're going down the wrong road. You better turn around. It's a call to turn to God. Now, again, you see all these things happening in the world in these two chapters symbolized by these seven trumpets that are blown. And you need to see and remember, they truly are the answer of God to the cry of the martyrs. They are directed at a specific group of people. These judgments are for the people who are warring against God and his people in chapter six, verse 10, as we hear their prayers. Okay. These judgments are directed as a warning to those who would stand in the way of God's kingdom coming. These judgments are for those who are in rebellion against God. Those who look at the Lamb of God and say, we don't want your way, we want our way. This is who they're for. Now, as you read, you could see chapter 9, verse 4, for example, shows us that even the locusts, okay, that were released from this bottomless pit, they were not allowed to harm those who were sealed of God. You see that there? Okay. And church, by the way, if you, if you were reading these things and you thought it all, even for just a moment, that, that a lot of these plagues and things we're reading about... If you thought even for a moment, man, this kind of reminds me of Egypt, kind of reminds me of the story of Exodus. If you thought that, I'm really glad because that, that's intentional. The plagues of Egypt were absolutely a part of this reality, the judgment of God against the wicked. What were those things? They were a warning to Pharaoh and to Egypt to turn to the Lamb of God, which of course they did not, right? Now, Even if you look at those plagues, although everyone was affected to some degree by the plagues of Egypt, it was only God's people who were marked by the blood of the lamb who were kept safe, right? 
And those who refused the blood of the lamb faced the full destruction of the judgment, right? Now, listen, these partial judgments we're talking about here, these partial judgments are being used as a warning to the wicked, to the, to the wicked world at large, that time is running out because total judgment is coming. Okay? This is a, this is a, a last call to turn to God. I was reading this week, um, uh, one author, I can't remember who it was, I'm sorry, said that, that these trumpet judgments show the world that everything they could trust in besides God for salvation will fail them. It shows them that, that as they trust in themselves and the, in their, their status or their own wealth or anything they could build for themselves, as they trust in anything that they might make with their own hands or, or use their time or talents for, these judgments announce to the world that anything besides God himself and the Lamb of God is just a blind, deaf, worthless idol that cannot save you. That's what these judgments are screaming into the world. There is salvation in nothing and no one else but the Lamb of God. And family, in, in learning this lesson, in learning that truth... They are experiencing the mercy of God. They're experiencing the mercy of God. And so let's take a look at these seven trumpets. Okay. There's so much symbolism within all these things. Gosh, we could never unpack it all in 30 minutes. But believe me when I tell you this, the most important thing is that you understand what the purpose of these judgments was and is and for whom they're intended. Okay. So let's look at this. The first four trumpets, you'll notice as you read in in chapter 8, 6 through 13, the first four of these trumpet judgments all include and involve creation, the natural world itself, okay? Trumpet one, for example, uh, John says he sees hail and fire mixed with blood in which one third of the earth and vegetation is burned. It's destroyed. Trumpet two, he says he sees this great mountain burning with fire and it's thrown into the sea. And then a third of the sea and the creatures and the ships and trade and commerce and all of these things are affected by this. Trumpet three, he says he sees a great star called Wormwood and it falls from heaven and it ruins a third of the rivers and the springs of water or poison and and people are sick and dying because of that and then trumpet four if you look John says he sees that a third of the sun moon and stars were darkened and it messed up the whole rhythm natural rhythm of days and nights in the world family look What these four trumpets are pointing to symbolically is this. Uh, One scholar said, it's nature gone berserk. (laughs) It's creation gone crazy. It's, It's showing people, family, ultimately this, that the things that we might look to in creation for salvation cannot save us. Therefore, we don't hope in creation. We hope in the creator. This is what we're supposed to see. Creation is a false savior. Only the creator can truly save. Uh, Another commentator I was reading said this. I thought it was really helpful. He said, note the progression of these judgments from earth and food supplies with the devastation or the vegetation and the devastation that's there. He said from earth and food supplies to the seas and commerce on the seas to the drinking water to the light by which we see. He said each one getting closer and closer to humanity itself. He said these are natural forces let loose out of whack no longer operating in their intended ways. And don't we see that in the world all around us? I mean, you can just see it all right now. Creation out of whack. Then you look at the next two, trumpets five and six, which are not natural forces, which is intense enough, but we actually see these are demonic forces, spiritual forces let loose in the world. Trumpet five, John says he sees locusts come from the bottomless pit, 
This army that's coming out in verse 11 and 12, we're told this army, this spiritual army is led by a demon named Apollyon. That's pretty intense. This is a real spiritual world and force we're talking about. It's, it's just, it's this crazy powerful thing to see because I don't know if you, if you read that one more in depth, John says he first sees a star fall from heaven. Now, most scholars believe, and I do too, that he's talking about Satan. Uh, Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 uh, says, how you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. Speaking of the devil, he says, you have been cut down to earth, you who have weakened the nations. So John sees this. And then he says here in chapter nine, that a key to this bottomless pit and to Hades was given to this guy. And, and what do we know? We know from Revelation chapter one, that Christ alone has the keys. And we know that the devil nor any of his demons could ever go take anything from God. And so what we're actually witnessing family, as intense as it is, is God grants permission to the devil and his demons to unleash the this judgment into the world. That it's basically God saying to the wicked and evil in the world, you want all this? Experience it. I heard one pastor say, uh, the whole of the human life is this, is this. Either you say to God, thy will be done, or God says to you, thy will be done. And that's what, that's what we're seeing. But, but follow me on this. As scary as it is, and it is, we're actually told this stuff. We're actually told that, that, that this star, fallen star, is given the keys, given permission to do these things in the world. Believe it or not, family, we're actually told that so that we would not be afraid. You might be like, are you insane? Listen, we're actually told it so we wouldn't be afraid. As the drama unfolds in the world and the judgment moves against the wicked, we're being shown, family, that even in the terrible realities that are unfolding, evil does not have free reign. Evil is not allowed to work in the world unchecked. You see this even in the book of Job. The devil can only operate within the parameters God allows him to. It's like... You've never seen such little power go to someone's head, huh? The devil, he can't do what he wants. You know what that means? I mean, some really good news for us. It means that as this fallen sinful world wars against the coming of the Lamb of God, it means that God's people can rest assured that we're safe in the arms of the Lord. It means that we can rest assured that this war is already won, that God is already victorious, and that come what may, we will stand before the throne of God in the end victorious. This is good news for us. And so, family, what's the point of it all? Like, what, what is being communicated here? Uh, I think G.K. Beale said it best. I'll put this on the screen as well for you. God is saying to the wicked and evil in the world, you want the way of destruction over the way of the lamb? Fine. I'll open the pit. You want to glorify those who destroy others? Fine. I'll open the pit. It's God saying to them, I'll show you what the result is of your wickedness and evil in the world. And family, Scripture tells us very clearly that the result of sin and evil in the world, the wages of sin, is only death. That's the only place it leads. There is no other result but death. Again, we're told in verse 4 and 5 of chapter 9 that these demonic forces were not permitted to move against the sealed people of God. Family, this is a warning to the wicked, a partial judgment that is giving them a taste of the complete judgment that is coming. Evil will be eradicated in the world family. And isn't that good news? It's coming. Now, I'm going to come back at the end and talk to you guys about verse six, because I guarantee you, as you read chapter nine, you got to verse six and you were like, what is going on? We're going to talk about it, but first let's finish the trumpets. Okay. 
Trumpet six, we get to trumpet six. And uh, what we see at trumpet six is the release of these four angels that we're told were bound at the great river Euphrates. And as God pulls these angels back, there's this assault on the wicked that's launched there. Now, that one, I don't know about you guys, I'm reading, it seems kind of weird, right? And, and I think it's weird to us on purpose because we weren't the original uh, recipients of this. Remember, the book of Revelation was written for us, but it wasn't written to us. And so when you, it seems kind of weird until you realize that the readers in the first century knew and understood that the Euphrates River was actually the extreme easternmost horizon of the Roman Empire. And it was actually from the east that the Romans feared an invasion would come and topple them and remove them from authority. So when you know that, you read this trumpet and and you realize it's a warning to the wicked that these angels will no longer hold back, but will allow destruction upon the wicked to happen in a way that's overwhelming and powerful. That's the imagery. And I mean, you guys read it like you can look at that, like the description of this army that's like released is intense. (laughs) There's this overwhelming number and soldiers have heads like lions and horses and they're going to sting and torment like scorpions. I mean, it's a lot. You're, You're reading that and you're just going, this is terrifying. But that's the point. God is saying to the wicked, you cannot stand in the day of judgment. Your destruction will be complete and utter. Now, I know that some of the books out there on Revelation, some of the books some of you guys are reading, are trying to say that this army in chapter 9 is literal, and all these things are, are literal things. Guys, you shouldn't take things literal in a book that's not written literally. I talked with somebody once who said, the, they're, they're like, man, I can't wait for this chapter because the, the chapter nine is so amazing. Because when you look at the horses, like in verse 19 with the serpent heads and the scorpion tails, they're like, isn't it crazy? John is seeing like modern day Black Hawk helicopters. And he just went on and on. He was telling me about this book that like compares all these things with like our military and things around the world. Guys, look. Remember, the text cannot mean what it never meant. It doesn't mean something for us that it never meant for them. And I just want to assure you, the readers of this letter in the first century did not read chapter 9 and think Black Hawk Hellies. They didn't think it, so it can't mean it. All right? Look. The rich symbolism in all of these things is simply to convey an overwhelming destruction that is coming against the wicked and evil in this world. It is a judgment that is being held back in part, even now, in the mercy of God, so that the wicked might see might see the sin and the error of their ways and turn to the Lamb of God. That's the whole point of this. Now, listen, you guys need to know something, and I'll jump back to verse 6 of chapter 9. You guys need to know something. There is something far worse than physical death, okay? And it's referred to in Scripture as the second death. It's a spiritual death where forever the body and the soul is separated from the loving, merciful, gracious presence of God in a place called hell. Okay. All of these judgments are a merciful God crying out to those in unbelief to turn to the lamb before it's too late. And we actually actually see the mercy of God powerfully in chapter 9, verse 6, where in the midst of all of this judgment happening, look what it says. It says, and in those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. That's a pretty intense thing to read, don't you think? I mean, I don't care who you are. It's like, oof, 
What is happening? Listen, with all that's going on in this, I want to read you something from theologian Daryl Johnson. I just can't say it any better. It's kind of long, but I'm like, why, why recreate the wheel? I want to read to you guys uh, what's going on because I think it's powerful and beautiful and it helps us live in the tension. I'll put it on the screen for you. It's kind of long. He said, the angels blow the trumpets to get our attention, to warn us, speaking of a wicked world, to call us to repentance. This is what this terrifying scene in Revelation chapters 8 through 11 is all about, calling us to repentance. And then he talked in in the book, he's talking about why why is it so intense then? Like, why why is it so violent? He says this, C.S. Lewis put it this way. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts to us in our pain. He says, can you hear it? It's being screamed out from every corner of the globe. These these judgments are screaming out, something is wrong, something is off. It's God saying, you're ignoring me and my way. You are headed for destruction. Turn around. Course correct. And then he goes on to say this, the real tragedy of this scene, of the sounding of the seven trumpets, is that not everybody repents. According to John, there are two other responses. One is to simply harden your heart against God even more, which if you guys look at chapter 9, verse 20 and 21, that's what happened. He says the other is to want to die, but not be able to do so, as mentioned in verse 6. In verse 6, death flees because God is seeking repentance. Look what he says. Know this. Death is not the worst thing that can happen to a person. The worst thing is living unrepentant, missing out on life with the living God. So death is kept at bay, making more opportunity for repentance. This is sheer, amazing grace. Family, I know that there's tension there. I know it's, it's, it's more cloudy than we would like it to be. But, but, but what we're seeing here, guys, is the reality of that other world that we're caught between. Like, we can all see the world around us. But unless we're shown through means like this scripture and this vision, it's easy for us to miss the reality of the spiritual world that's just as real as the one we can see. We are caught between two worlds. There is a war going on in the world for the souls of men. God is filled with grace and mercy towards sinners, thanks be to God. Even those who reject him and rebel against him and work alongside evil and wickedness now. God is filled with mercy right now. These chapters and the next two chapters show us that the justice and judgment of God is real. But so is his mercy. The call is to turn from your sin, to humble yourself, and to follow the way of the Lamb. The call is to place your faith and trust in the salvation that belongs to God and that is in the gospel of the Lord Jesus who lived, died, and rose again for you. And so, Living Stones, see the justice of God in these things. See it, it's real. But see also the mercy of God, because it's real too. Look, if you're here and you're not a believer in Christ, this call to repentance, to turn from sin and trust in God through faith, this is a call for you today too. Like you need to hear, there is nothing in this world that can save you but Jesus Christ. There is forgiveness for sin nowhere else in Christ. There is nothing you can build for yourself, nothing you can amass for yourself. There is nothing you will find in the world that is enough to save you. Only Christ. Judgment is coming to the world. Like it's here now only in part, but it is coming fully. God's mercy is for you right now. His love is for you right now. He's calling you right now. Turn from your sin and turn to Jesus in faith and find salvation for your soul. 
Family, God is patient and long-suffering, but he will not be patient forever. Really, what the scripture says is true. Today is the day of salvation. Don't wait. Christians, rest. Some of you guys are like, are you insane? You, what you just told us for the last 30 minutes, you're going to tell us to rest now? Yeah. Yeah. Christians, rest knowing that for all sealed by God, we will endure. That we cannot be utterly destroyed. Rest knowing that eternity with our God awaits us. That the kingdom of our God will become the kingdom of this world and we will worship and enjoy God in perfect peace forever. Rest in that. Family, God is just and holy and righteous, but he's also loving and gracious and merciful. And he's calling every one of us to see him and to turn to him in faith that we might be saved from the judgment to come. So family, see the mercy of God calling you today. Take hope in the salvation of God that's yours through faith. And rejoice that if you belong to God, there is nothing and no one that could ever take you out of his hand. Let's pray together. God, we have talked about a lot of things today. We see the intensity of your judgment against the wicked in the world. We feel it. We see it around us. We we see it like, like Israel saw the plagues in Egypt. We're affected in part by so many of these things. We see the brokenness, the pain around us. We experience the death. We turn on the news for five minutes. It's what we see. But God, I pray that your people would be not a people of despair, but a people of hope. I pray, God, that through our faith in you, with our eyes on the king on the throne, We would live and endure in this world faithfully, announcing the gospel of the love and grace of Jesus boldly to anyone who would hear. God, I pray that you would protect our families and our kids from being discipled, not by the word of God, but by the world. I pray for the parents here who are leading their families, trying to lead their children to know who you are because they're going to need you in this world. God, I pray that you would give grace to those of us who are who are doing our best. We're navigating all this crazy, but we're keeping our eyes on you. God, we trust that you're holy and just. And we know as we sang, one day we're gonna behold you and the war is gonna be over and every tear is gonna be wiped away and we're, we're gonna see you. And all this is gonna be worth it. We're gonna understand all the things we don't, but until then, God, fix our eyes on you. As we take communion, God, would you fill us with joy? Would you remind us that you loved us so much you wouldn't let the darkness have us? You bought us back. Thank you for your life, death, and resurrection that is our salvation. God, would the joy that we feel in that moment overflow into our generosity of you through our tithes and our offerings? God, you're not broke in heaven. You don't need our money, but you want our hearts. And so would you just cause us to be generous to you together? Would you provide for our church, God, as we go into this fall and winter season? And then God, would we sing out loudly to you? We love you. Thank you for loving us. We're ready to worship you. We pray it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Church, what we saw today was the righteous judgment of God being poured out on the earth against wicked and evil doers. As difficult as it is to read and hear, we learn that these partial judgments were actually a sign of God's mercy as he leads them to repentance. Today, many of us, like many of them in the text, are not quick to repent and to trust in Jesus. Let's confess our sin of looking to other things for salvation and hope. Let's ask for the grace that Jesus would truly be our everything.
Micah 7, 18 through 19 says, Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea. Church, as we confess, God is faithful to forgive us. One way we celebrate this forgiveness is through communion. Now, for those of you here who are just investigating Christianity or may not consider Jesus your savior, I would respectfully ask that you let the plates pass you by. It wouldn't make sense to do something with your hands that your heart doesn't believe in. During this time, there's going to be a prayer on the side screens, and I would encourage you to consider trusting in Jesus today. At the end of the service, we're gonna have pastors and leaders up here at the front if you need prayer for anything, or if you have questions about what living for Christ looks like. For the Christians in the room, communion is a time to be reminded of Christ's sacrifice for us. 1 Corinthians 11:26 says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Church, to remember Christ's, Christ's life, death, and resurrection, we recite together the words on the screen. Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. Let's take communion now. church. In just a minute, we're going to continue in worship with a time of giving with our tithes and offerings. It's something we do every week here because we're committed to make Jesus known in our community and around the world. In Mark 4, 3 through 9, Jesus talked about planting different types of soil, seeds in different types of soil. He spoke about the difference between the seeds that were planted in rocky ground amongst the words and then seeds that were planted on good ground in fresh, healthy soil. He teaches about the bountiful crop that happens when a seed falls on good soil. I wanted to encourage you as you prepare to give that your gift is as a seed that is being planted in the good soil of God's work, his church, and his mission. When we are all generous to God together, God uses that gift to bring about a great harvest. Your gifts not only support the mission of God here in Elko through the provision needed to, to exist here to support our staff, our pastors, our church planters, not only does it go towards helping those who um, are in need but have nowhere else to turn to, but it also reaches around the world and supports gospel work abroad. Family, that is good work on good soil. When you give here, you can know that we're going to use everything to keep doing work like that, and you get to be a part of it. As we give, let's prayerfully ask the Lord for a bountiful harvest as we offer our gifts to him. The baskets will be passed around in just a moment and feel free to pull out your phone and use the online methods on the side screens as well. Let's receive our offering now. Oh, well church, we got to hear a lot of stuff today, didn't we? Yeah, yes. And the good news that we have um, is that God is in control of all of this stuff, all of the craziness, all of the chaos, all of the things that we don't know, we don't understand, but God's got us. Thank God for that. Amen. Amen. So as we sing this next song, let this be a prayer as we're processing all the things that we've heard today and as we navigate um, our life going forward, um, that God would just give us clarity and that we would just fix our eyes and our hearts on him. So let's all stand together and let this be our prayer today. So that I can 
church. Amen.
All right. Thank you guys so much for joining us for worship today. Can we give it up for our worship team just one more time for leading us so well this morning? Oh, all right. Um, thank you guys so much for being here. Like I said earlier, there's going to be pastors and leaders up front. If you need prayer for absolutely anything, don't hesitate to come up and ask. We've got invite cards on your way out the door, so make sure to grab a couple of those and be inviting people to church this season. Um, and lastly, if you have kids back in the LS Kids classrooms, we ask very respectfully that you would go grab them pretty quick before you get to too much chit chat and just so our teachers can reset for the next service. Thank you so much. Um, and lastly, be sure to wish Pastor Nathan a happy birthday on your way out the door. It's his birthday this Sunday. All right, guys, if you would open your hands as if to receive our missional sending and benediction this morning. This year, as we strive to help everyone find everything in Jesus, may we carry out to our community the truth that salvation can be found in no one else other than Jesus Christ. As the world experiences the brokenness and the judgments of God that we've talked about today, may we be quick to respond with grace and joy and hope to anyone that God would give us the chance to share his love with. And in benediction, Colossians 3, 16 through 17 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Go in peace, church. You are dismissed. Come and give him a praise in this place. I want to dance like David, I want to faith like Paul, I want to sing like Silas tearing down the prison walls, I want to face that fire, it won't burn me though, God's got my back, let's do it, hey, put those hands together. I wanna dance like David. I 